reverse the standard. No matter how dark the skin, woolly the hair, or thick the lips, you don't have to be a Negro. When black contribution to civilization is too obvious, let's find a way to attribute it to outside white influences. When all the ancient historians contradict your theory, we'll just discredit them. The Catholic Church on the Apache Reservation, uh, you don't hear about this. You know, we, we hear about protests everywhere. Uh, the Apache's sacred mountain, their most sacred mountain, the Vatican somehow got permission, permission from the U.S. government to build a observatory on top of this mountain. And of all the names that they choose, the acronym for this observatory is Lucifer. So, you know, the, the Apache people are still protesting it. It's their most sacred mountain. Why? They say, according to their oral tradition, that this is where they would communicate with the gods. This is where they would communicate with the star beings and the people from the heavens. Uh, and this is exactly where the Catholic Church comes and builds this observatory. Why do you think that is? To me, it's obvious that they, I mean, they're in one accord with all those things. To me, I mean, when I see what they've got going on, of course, the people that haven't looked into the Catholic origins and looked into the rituals and looked into the reasons behind them, it would seem like a mystery. But um, to us, obviously, it's it makes a lot of sense, you know, uh, yeah. why they would do this stuff because they are trying to channel these things. And that's why the militaries build bases on these things. They're trying to channel these things mm -hmm. and uh, channel whatever whatever is coming through there. I know in different uh, religions and cultures, they want to call it whatever, whether they want to call it the Mahat a universal mind, whether they want to call it um, chi or whatever they want to call it. Some some places don't really describe an entity a lot attached with it, more of an energy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it, it's it's pretty amazing. And um, you know, I, I guess when I when I see when I see all these ancient societies, and I see a lot of because I mean, when you look at the mounds, they uh, obviously had some kind of um, you know, we, we talked about the agenda. They did it. You said they built it underneath the constellation Draco. It's built on ley lines. It's built with the solstice markers. Um, this, this stuff ties in with every ancient civilization in the world and to have it so scattered all over the world that these, these things happen. And I know, I remember you talked before because a lot of people believe that the native Americans were mound builders, but you, I believe you have told me before that that's not the case. Um, that's just usually not what they do. Right. A lot, a lot of the tribes, when, when you ask the elders who built the mounds, uh, typically the answer that you're going to hear is we didn't build them. Uh, they were here when we already got here or the giants built them. Uh, now that's not to say that native people did not build mounds, uh, to try to copy, uh, what they had, what they were seeing around them. And we do have evidence of that. And then we see mounds that are smaller, not these great stature, uh, or size of, of mounds that, that you typically see like in the ancient earthworks. Uh, so, so although there is mound building that was done uh, by native tribes, uh, for the most part, uh, not to the stature of, of you know, what, this Nephilim architecture, this, these gigantic earthworks uh, that were built long before, you know, th it's 300, 400 BC, um, any of the other uh, tribes that ever even been in this area. Uh, so, that, that's the that's typically what you're going to hear from native people uh, concerning the mounds. Uh, but but regardless of that, the native people are also going to be fierce protectors uh, of these sites of these sacred sites uh, because that I mean that's that's part of the part of the code of Indian living uh, is, is being protectors of these sacred grounds uh, regardless of European who built them. Names. This will disguise their true black identity. Let's change the criteria defining race for example one drop of negro blood in america makes you a negro no matter how light the now skin. when we're looking at these mounds um of course um when we were out on the site um whoever's putting up kind of the tourist signs and stuff um they're attributing a lot of these mounds to the native people um who who's kind of disseminating that information and um because i mean why, why are they saying there that the natives have made it if most of the tribal uh, people that are being asked are denying any involvement in the mounds themselves? Uh, I've, I've never quite understood that, Jake. 
uh, even when, when I was taking anthropology and archaeology courses and, uh, and, and doing my graduate studies, and uh, I was just floored at how few or, or how little uh, the oral tradition of the native people was even considered as a valid source uh, for, you know, explaining archaeological finds or artifacts or, you know, any, anything that was discovered by academia. Um, I, was actually, I was actually told by my professor that the native oral tradition uh, doesn't hold any weight uh, because it wasn't in writing, because we didn't write anything down. Well, the Mayans and Incans, uh, they did. The Mayans especially wrote a lot of their history down. Uh, despite, you know, the Catholics uh, coming in and burning scrolls and untold, uh, who knows, years, centuries worth of, of history of, of ancient America. Uh, they're still writing that, that's been left behind. The oral tradition isn't just a telephone game story where one native, you know, tells it to another native. And then by the time the fifth native hears it, the story's changed. Uh, the traditional storytellers are, are chosen from birth. Uh, it, it still happens this way. They're chosen from birth um, <clears throat> and, and, then, and then picked uh, which one has a, a propensity for memorization. And then those are trained uh, to be the storytellers. They're trained this way because they cannot add a word to a story and they can't take one away. And they have to tell the story the same way it was told uh, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or 2,000 years ago. So the integrity of the story doesn't change. When we look at how um, the American government, uh, the U.S. government, has kind of, in a way, created their own version of Native history, um, and with some of your work kind of showing uh, the the idea that a lot of the Native tribes migrated from the Middle East, have lineage back to the tribes of Israel, um, what do you see as kind of the purpose be be behind this false history that so that I remember hearing growing up in school in the history textbooks. Oh, you know, Christopher Columbus got over here and he found the natives here and they'd been here all along. And there's <laughs> no way that they, you know. So, so what is kind of the agenda behind this false narrative, this false history that's being told about the natives um, here in the Americas? And you know, what what do you have to say about what's kind of being perpetrated in schools in history books um, that flat out deny the idea that native tribes migrated over from the Middle East. Um, you know, you know, what is what is the purpose of this false narrative? I, I, I often rack my brain trying to figure that out. And now I don't think that all tribes uh, have, have a Hebraic origin. Uh, I don't believe that all tribes have, have that Semitic uh, genetics, uh, but I do. Uh, I mean, the research does really point to some tribes uh, that not just through linguistics, but through cultural traditions, through spiritual traditions, uh, and even now through DNA. National Geographic just did an article a few years ago uh, talking about the origin of, of some tribes and the native DNA, and the, and the markers that were showing up were Middle Eastern markers. Uh, so, and this is mostly tribes that were on the East Coast, uh, and it's also, also in the Southwestern part of the country. Uh, cover up why the, the blatant yeah, I, I can't even begin to, to understand. Uh, there is, for example, there is absolute concrete archaeological evidence that the Mayans and the Incans uh, were all the way up through Florida, uh, even as far as Okmulgee, Georgia, and going into Ohio. Uh, there is a definite Mayan Incan influence uh, in architecture, in religion, in the art, in the iconography. Uh, you definitely see the Central American motifs religion, spiritual way, cultures, and traditions. Why do archaeologists deny it? I don't know. Do they, do they want to deny? Uh, I guess they don't want to say, oh, well, you know what? These people aren't actually immigrants from south of the border. They've been here longer than anybody else have. Uh, I, I don't know. That's just me being cynical. You know, but it proves that there was a presence here of indigenous people from south of the border. Uh, it also disproves a lot of the, uh, the theories of academia I mean, there is a, a complete blatant denial. They are the oldest skulls in the Americas. And this 
This is the oldest of them all. The skull of a young woman nicknamed Luthia by scientists. Can she tell us who the first Americans were? Walter Nevis is a physical anthropologist at Sao Paulo University in Brazil. He's been using a standard and reliable archaeological measure, the shape of the skull, to find out what race she belonged to. He fully expected Luthia to be a mongoloid, an ancestor of the American Indians. But then he fed the measurements into the computer. When we start running the computer and uh, seeing the results, uh, it was amazing because we realized that uh, uh, the statistics, the quantitative analysis we were doing was not showing these people to be mongoloid. In fact, the analysis was showing these people was anything except mongoloid. So who was Luthia? And where did she come from? find out, the skull was taken to a hospital in Rio de Janeiro to begin the process of reconstructing her face. The first stage was to make a three-dimensional CAT scan of Luthia's skull in order to build a replica. was then given to Richard Neve of the University of Manchester in England, one of the world's leading forensic artists to recreate her features. To me, is a Negroid face that has all the features you associate with a Negroid face. The um, proportions of the face, it doesn't say anything about it being a Mongoloid. When black contribution to civilization is too obvious, let's find a way to attribute it to outside white influences. When all the ancient historians contradict your theory, we'll just discredit them. <laughs> 